Hello and welcome to the second video dedicated to the engineering thermodynamics. Today's topic is energy, work, and the first law of thermodynamics. In this video, I'm going to discuss different types of energy, microscopic and microscopic. Then I'm going to uh, expand on the concept of internal energy. After that, I'll talk about heat transfer, thermal equilibrium, and the zero flow of thermodynamics. Work and its different forms is the next topic. And knowing both heat and work, uh, we'll be able to introduce the first law of thermodynamics. And finally, uh, to wrap the video up, we will discuss the definition of efficiency. Every one of us has a general understanding of the concept of energy from either our experience in life or basic courses like physics and such. Here, we try to classify energy so we can more easily analyze it. There are different forms of energy. Thermal, kinetic, potential, chemical, and nuclear are just a few examples of energy form varieties. The sum of all these forms of energy for a given system is called total energy of the system. We show it by uh, capital letter E, and its unit in SI is kilojoule. E is a property of the system. We have an energy per unit mass of the system, which we show by small letter E, and the unit is kilojoules per kilogram. Take note that E is an extensive property, while small letter E is an intensive one. Now in thermo, we almost never deal with the absolute values of energy of a system. Rather, we are always interested in the change of energy. So it's always practical to set a convenient state or reference point and assume energy of the system is zero at that state or reference point. I'll give examples of this in a few minutes. In general, there are two main categories of energy, macroscopic and microscopic. Microscopic energies are the forms that are measured with respect to an external reference frame uh, like kinetic and potential energies. Okay, let's expand on that definition first. Let's assume you are riding a car going at 30 miles per hour to right, and you're holding your cell phone in your hand. There is also a guy on the sidewalk looking at you. Although you're moving with 30 miles per hour, the cell phone doesn't have any kinetic or motion energy with regards to you, the passenger, while the guy on the sidewalk sees a cell phone moving at 30 miles per hour, and so relative to him, the phone has kinetic energy. We see, based on our outside reference point, whether it's you or the sidewalk guy, the kinetic energy changes. Now the same thing goes for gravitational potential energy. Let's assume there is a box on a table. This box has no potential energy with respect to the table surface. But if we move our reference point down to the green line level, we get potential energy is mass times g gravitational acceleration times h, the distance between the box and the reference green line. So again, potential energy depends on our outside reference frame. Okay, we talked about macroscopic energy. Now we can focus on microscopic ones. Any form of energy relating to molecular and smaller scales activities within a substance is considered microscopic. We have a name for the total sum of all microscopic energies of a system. We call it the internal energy. We show it with capital letter U with unit of kilojoules. And we also have a per unit mass form. We show it with small letter U and the unit is kilojoules per kilogram. Both are properties of the system. Capital U is extensive while small letter u is intensive. Okay, uh, with the definition of microscopic and macroscopic energies out of the way, we can uh, go back to microscopic energies. There are a few of them, like kinetic, potential, electric, uh, magnetic, and more, but here in thermodynamics, we are only interested in kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy includes both linear and rotational motions. For linear, kinetic energy is mass times linear velocity squared over 2. 
And for rotational energy, it's uh, the moment of inertia times angular velocity uh, squared over 2. Both of these are in kilojoules. Now, when discussing potential energy, please take note that we are only interested in gravitational potential energy. The equation for potential energy is very familiar for us. Potential energy is mass times gravitational acceleration times the elevation from the reference point, and the unit is kilojoules. Both kinetic and potential energies have per unit mass form formations. Kinetic energy per unit mass is linear velocity squared over 2, and uh, potential energy per unit mass is gravitational acceleration times z. Both have the units of kilojoules per kilogram. So the total energy of a system is the sum of all macroscopic and microscopic energies. That means capital letter E, or total energy of the system, is internal energy plus kinetic energy plus potential energy, or u plus mass velocity squared over 2 plus mass g z, and the unit is kilojoules. Small letter e, or the total energy of a system per unit mass, can be written as small letter u plus small letter kinetic energy plus small letter potential energy, or small letter u plus velocity squared over 2 plus g z. Now let's discuss a special scenario which we actually encounter a lot. Stationary closed system. An example for a stationary closed system is a soda can in the fridge. Because the soda can in the fridge, which is our system, has no motion or change of elevation, it doesn't have any kinetic or potential energy. So all of the total energy changes in the system are because of changes in internal energy. Now, when dealing with control volumes, we are usually dealing with fluid flow rates, and so it makes sense to include rate forms of energy too. The key here is the mass flow rate of our fluid. How do we find mass flow rate? Well, assume the pipe here, where fluid of density rho is going through with an average velocity of velocity average or V average. The cross-section of the pipe is also known, A. Mass flow rate, or M dot, is rho times velocity average times area. The unit will be in kilojoules per second. There is another type of flow rate known as volumetric flow rate, which has the unit of meters cubed per second. We show it by uh, capital V dot, and is equal to velocity average times area. So mass flow rate is volumetric flow rate times density. The rate of total energy can then be written as capital letter E dot is equal to M dot E. The unit will be kilojoules per second or kilowatts. All right, now we can start discussing internal energy. Internal energy can be viewed as the sum of kinetic and potential energies of the molecules. Let's take a container full of water, and then let's zoom in on this part of the container to molecular level. The big white circles is the oxygen atom, and smaller filled circles are hydrogen atoms. Kinetic energy of H2O molecules are shown here. An H2O molecule can move in a direction with some velocity and so having kinetic energy. We call it translational energy. The molecules can also rotate about an axis and have rotational energy. The atoms inside of the molecule may also vibrate and have a back and forth motion, which we call vibrational energy. We can go smaller than this and include the energy associated with electrons inside each atom as well. The sum of all these energies is called sensible energy. Temperature usually is associated with the level of molecular activity. 
That's why it's called sensible, because we can quote unquote sense the level of activity with temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the molecular activity level, which means higher internal energy. But that's not all of the internal energy. The water molecules may be moving, rotating, vibrating, or all of the above, but they are still bonded together to form a liquid, right? So when we introduce heat and the temperature rises, the molecular activity level also increases until we reach a certain point where temperature is not changing anymore. That's when boiling, or more scientifically stated, phase change starts. The molecules need a certain amount of energy to be able to break the molecular bonds that keep them liquid. When they get it, they overcome the bonding force and break free and go to gas form. The energy that represents the bonding forces that keep substances as solids and liquids is known as latent energy or hidden energy. Because temperature doesn't change during a phase change, it is called hidden energy. There are other types of bonding forces within a substance. Chemical energy, for example, represents the bonding forces that are keeping the atoms of different elements in a single molecule. For example, for a water molecule, there are two atoms of hydrogen attached to one single atom of oxygen. If the bonds between these atoms is broken, some sort of energy is released. That energy, we call it the chemical energy, is a representation of the bonding forces within a molecule. If we go smaller than that, there are other bonding forces acting on a single atom. We know that neutrons and protons are jam-packed inside an atom. There is a bonding force that is keeping these atoms plus the electron in the same vicinity. If this bond is broken, we get the nuclear energy. So nuclear energy is a representation of the bonding forces within a single atom. In thermodynamics, we are only interested in the sensible and the latent energies and we don't consider chemical and nuclear ones. As a side note, we sometimes call the sensible and later energies thermal energy to differentiate them from other forms of internal energy such as chemical and nuclear. One thing we need to pay attention to is that usually microscopic energies are more organized and useful, while microscopic ones not so much. Let me explain what I mean with an example. Okay, consider a dam. We got a lake behind it full of water with a considerable amount of internal energy, right? It's getting heat from the sun too, and the molecular level activity is crazy. But if we put a turbine or rather sink a turbine into the lake, would this internal energy, would this high level molecular activity be able to rotate this turbine and produce uh, useful work? The answer is no. The reason is that the internal energy is not organized. Now let's put the turbine somewhere else. Let's open a gate on the bottom of the dam and put the turbine in the way of the flow. It starts to generate useful work because we are now using the potential and kinetic energies of the water behind the dam which, as we discussed before, are macroscopic and organized, and so we are easily able to convert them to useful work. Our general goal in thermodynamic is to convert this random and unorganized microscopic energy into an organized, useful one. All right, we talked about thermal energy and now we can start talking about mechanical energy. By definition, mechanical energy is a form of energy that can completely and directly be used by a mechanical device like a turbine. Well, obviously, based on the examples that we discussed so far, kinetic and potential energies are two forms of mechanical energy. From the last example, the turbine in front of the fluid flow of a dam, we saw that the kinetic and potential energy can be directly used by the turbine. Now let's say we have a pipeline like this. Fluid is flowing uh, through this pipe due to an initial velocity upstream 
uh, we showed would be, and the gravitational potential energy because of the elevation changes between these two sections of the pipe. If we put a mechanical device like a turbine down here, we are able to turn the kinetic and potential energy of the flow into useful work. Okay, so far so good. Now, let's put a pump upstream of the flow, like here. Do you think that the now pressurized flow has more energy? Does it cause the tur turbine to generate more work? Well, the answer to those questions is yes, based on our experience. We know that the pressurized flow usually has more force behind it, generates more work. But can we show it with equations? Let's consider a section of the pipe. The flow inside has a pressure P. Let's take a fluid element uh, like this. Now, because of the pressure, this fluid element moves a distance to the right. Now, can you tell me how much work or energy is required to achieve this motion? Well, we know that work is force times the distance moved along the set force. Force here is pressure times the cross-section area of the element or the pipe. D times this area is actually the volume of the cylinder that covers the space the fluid element moved due to pressure P. So P times volume actually represents some sort of work done on the fluid element by the pressure. So PV actually represents another form of mechanical energy. Now for a pressurized flowing fluid, mechanical energy available is kinetic energy plus potential energy plus P times volume, which is mass times velocity squared over two plus mass times G times H plus PV with a unit of kilojoules. And the per unit mass is shown by small letter E is velocity squared over two plus GH plus P times specific volume. Now remember that the specific volume or small letter V is the inverse of density. So we can rewrite this equation uh, like this. E is velocity squared over two plus GH plus pressure over density. Now this form of the equation is very common in fluid mechanics, but here in thermo, we are happy with the P times a specific volume version of this equation. All right, uh, let's talk about heat. The form of energy that is transferred between systems or between a system and its surroundings due to temperature difference is called heat. So for example, take blocks A and B here. Uh, each has their own temperature, T temperature of A and temperature of B. If TA is greater than TB, then energy flows from A to B until TA and TB are equal and the transfer stops. This energy is called heat. A process that doesn't involve any heat transfer is called an adi adiabatic process. You will encounter this term adiabatic a lot in thermo. There are two ways of achieving an adiabatic process. Uh, the system is either insulated or the process happens super fast and the system doesn't have enough time to transfer any heat. We show heat with Q, capital letter Q, and the unit is again kilojoules. Per unit mass is small letter Q, is capital Q over mass, and the unit is kilojoules per kilogram. Sometimes we deal with heat transfer rates, especially when dealing with control volumes. We show the heat transfer rate by Q dot, and the unit is kilowatts. The equation that relates Q, heat transfer, and Q dot, rate of heat transfer, is shown here. Q is the integral of Q dot dt over the time period. Now, if we are dealing with a special case that the Q dot is constant, then the integral reduces to Q is equal to Q dot times delta t. Okay, um, now we have enough information to discuss the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Now, the zeroth law states that if two bodies are in thermal equilibrium with a third body, they are in thermal equilibrium with each other. So what does all this mean? First, let's start with the definition of thermal equilibrium. 
Thermal equilibrium means that there is no heat transfer happening between the two systems. Now, the reason that two systems don't have heat transfer is because they have the same temperature. So if block A with temperature A and block B with temperature B are in equilibrium, a thermal equilibrium, with block C with temperature C, then it means that temperature A is equal to temperature C because of their own equilibrium, and temperature B is equal to temperature C because of their own separate equilibrium. And so you can see from this algebra that the temperature of A is actually equal to the temperature of B because both of them are equal to temperature of C. Now, when testing this uh, zero flaw, usually the third body is a thermometer, which makes sense. You put the thermometer on block A, you read the temperature. You put the thermometer on block B, and you read the same temperature. You will conclude that both blocks A and B have the same temperature. Okay, with the definition of heat out of the way, we can talk about work. Any energy interaction of a system that is not heat is considered work. We show it with W, and the unit is kilojoules. Per unit mass is shown by small letter W, and the unit is kilojoules per kilogram. The rate form is also shown here. We show it with uh, W dot in kilowatts. The rate form of uh, work or work per unit time is called power. Keep that in mind. A couple of work types that we may encounter in thermodynamics are electric and shaft work. Electric work is voltage times amperage times time, and electric power is voltage times amperage. Shaft work is 2 pi times the number of revolutions times torque. Shaft power is 2 pi times the number of revolutions per unit time times torque. Okay, now we need to introduce a new concept, point functions and path functions. The definition for point and path functions are rather simple. Point functions are those whose integrals are independent of the path the process takes, while the path functions are those functions whose integrals are dependent on the process path. Let me give you an example of what I mean by these definitions. Consider this uh, pressure volume diagram, or PV diagram. Our system goes from state 1 to state 2 using two different paths. Path 1, the blue one, and path 2, the red one. We are interested to see how much has the volume of our system changed. Let's consider path 1. Delta volume, or delta V, is the integral dV from state 1 to state 2, which is the second volume minus the first volume, the initial volume. So delta V is V2 minus V1. If, the, if our system goes from state 1 to state 2 through the red line, how much has the volume changed? Again, delta V is the same integral from 1 to 2 of dV, which is V2 minus V1. Now you see, regardless of the path we take, the change of volume is the same. So volume is a point function. It is independent of the path that we take. We show the differential of point functions like volume with letter D. So whenever you see dV, it means that we are talking about the exact differential of volume. Now let's consider the work that our system does to go from state one to state two. We know that work from one to two is the integral from the state 1 to state 2 of dW. Previously, we showed that the mechanical work of a pressurized system is related to pressure and volume. So the work from state 1 to 2 for path 1 is the integral from state 1 to state 2 of pressure times d volume, which is equal to the area under the path 1 curve, this blue hatched area. For path 2, however, W from 1 to 2 is the area under path 2 curve, or the red line, which is this red area. As you can see, blue and red areas are not equal. And so the work from state 1 to state 2 for paths 1 and 2 are not equal. 
So work is dependent on the process path and is a path function. A path function like work has inexact differential. We show the inexact differentials with Greek letter delta. Volume, mass, temperature, pressure, and such are point functions, where work and heat transfer both are path functions. Knowing this can help us later on to calculate work and heat values using diagrams only. All right, here we are finally. The first law of thermodynamics, also known as conservation of energy, also known as energy balance. The first law of thermodynamics states that the net change in the total energy of a system is equal to the difference between the total energy entering and the total energy leaving the set system. This means that the change of total energy of a system is accounted for, and no energy is created or destroyed. It only enters or exits the system or changes and converts to another form inside the system. Now, there are a few keywords here that need some attention. So let's formulate the statement uh, with an equation so we can discuss these keywords. Total energy in minus total energy out is the change of total energy of the system. Let's first focus on the net change of total energy. Delta E is the total energy of a system at final state, we show it with E2, minus the total energy of the system at initial state, we show it with E1. Remember that the total energy is potential energy plus kinetic energy plus the internal energy. So delta E is delta U plus delta kin kinetic energy plus delta potential energy. Now the equation for each of these energies are shown here. Please take note that we still don't have enough information on how to find internal energy of a system. It's a topic for future videos. Okay, back to our first law equation. Let's focus on the energy entering and exiting a system. Energy can interact with a system in three ways. First is the heat transfer. Second is true work. And third is true mass flow. Work and heat are common for both systems and control volumes, but mass flow is exclusive to control volumes. Okay, let's show these three ways of interaction by equations. Energy coming in minus energy going out is actually all the Qs or heats entering the system minus all the Qs or heats leaving the system plus all the works entering the system or the works done on the system, minus all of the work that is leaving the system, meaning the work that the system is doing or done by the system, plus all the energies brought in by mass flows, minus everything that the mass flow takes out of our system. To wrap it up, delta E is Q net plus W net plus the energy of mass flow net. Okay, we have the rate form of the first law as well. E dot in minus E dot out is D energy of the system over DT. Per unit mass form can also be written as E in minus E out is delta E of the system. When dealing with a cycle, because the final and initial states of the cycle are the same, delta E of the system is zero. And so energy in is equal to energy out. Whatever you get into the system is equal to whatever you get out of the system. Okay, we defined the Q net and W net a few pages back. And using that definition is definitely okay. However, in engineering, we nearly always try to produce work or power from our systems, right? So it makes sense that work out or work done by the system is desirable for us and so we treat it as a positive parameter, despite the fact that it clearly reduces the energy of the system. And of course, W in, which is the work done on the system, is not desirable for us, because the system is consuming useful work instead of producing any. So it's a negative parameter for us, despite the fact that it's increasing the total energy of our system. So with that in mind, we are going to list the positives and negatives here again. For us engineers, heat coming in and work going out are both positive 
while heat going out and work coming in are natives. In order to compensate for this new way of looking at work, we can rewrite the first law again, stating that delta E of the system is heat coming in minus heat going out minus work going out minus work coming in. Please take note that you have to plug in positive algebraic values for each of these parameters in these equations. The change of sign is already incorporated in the new equation. So with this new rewritten equation, net value of Q is still Q in minus Q out. However, the net value of work has changed to work out minus work coming in. If W net is positive, it means that the system is generating work. And if it's negative, it means the system is consuming work. Again, remember to put positive algebraic values for individual plugins. We've already compensated for that change of sign. We can reduce the first law into this. Delta E of a system is Q net minus W net, which is the most common form of writing or expressing the first law. As discussed before, for a cycle, delta E of a system is zero. When that's the case, Q net equals W net meaning all of the heat that you put in the system is equal to all of the work that you get out of the system. Okay, we pretty much covered the first law, and now we can discuss efficiencies. Efficiency, we show it by Greek letter eta, is the desired output of a system over its required input. And so because a system cannot produce more work or energy that it's given to because of the first law, efficiencies are always in the range of zero and one. For example, the efficiency of an electrical heater is the heat that you get over the electric power it consumes. You get the heat, but pay for the electric power, so it's in your interest to go for higher efficiency heaters. Okay, but how do we calculate the efficiency of a more complex system? What, what should we do if we have a few devices connected to each other and each has an individual efficiency? How can we calculate the overall efficiency of our setup? So here's an example for you. We want to convert fuel into electricity. In order to do so, we need to use a few devices in between. We first need to burn the fuel in a combustion chamber to produce heat, then use that heat on a mechanical device like a turbine to generate power and then use that power or work on a generator to produce electricity. Now that we know the input and output of each individual component, we can calculate each component's individual efficiency. So the efficiency of the combustion chamber is the amount of heat it produces over the fuel that it consumes. The efficiency of the turbine is the work or power it produces over the heat input. And the efficiency of the generator is the electric power it produces over its work input. Okay, so these were the individual effic efficiencies. How about the overall efficiency? As we said before, the overall efficiency is the electric power over the fuel input. Now let's do a bit of algebra here. I can rewrite this equation in this form. Heat over fuel times work over heat times electric power over work. Now, the numerator and denominator of these uh, additional fractions will cancel each other, so we're good. But each of these fractions are the definition of an individual device efficiency. So the overall efficiency of our connected system is the product of all of the components efficiencies. Another way of expressing efficiency is writing it in the form of energy out over energy in. Because usually energy out is our desired form of energy or work. Energy out is actually energy in minus energy loss. Now energy loss can be anything. It can be because of the heat transfer out of the system, because of the friction, because it has converted into uh, some sort of internal energy, anything. E in minus E loss over E in can be written as one minus E loss over E in. 
Now, finally, in the rate form, efficiency is e dot out or e dot in. Thank you for staying to the end of yet another video. If you find this video helpful, please give it a like as it greatly helps the channel. Also, please consider subscribing for more science and engineering content. Thanks again and see you in another video.